Hello everyone, welcome to Raw Online. So in this session, we are going to try to understand the very important arrhythmia, the most common sustained arrhythmia among adults, which is atrial fibrillation. And as you all must be familiar, this is a hot favorite topic amongst examiners, be it in theory exams or in practical exams or in competitive examinations. And hence, it's very important that our understanding of this topic is thorough. So let's dive straight ahead. What is atrial fibrillation? Now, this is a cardiac arrhythmia characterized by seemingly disorganized, rapid and irregular atrial activation. Stress on three important words, disorganized, so chaotic, rapid and irregular atrial activation that is going to result in loss of organized atrial mechanical contraction. So, there is going to be a chaotic, rapid and an irregular activation of the atria and that is going to result in loss of effective organized contraction. Just to recap our approach to tachycardia so that you would understand where exactly atrial fibrillation fits in in this algorithm. So, how do we approach tachycardias? So, tachycardias can be divided into narrow complex and broad complex tachycardias depending on the QRS duration. And if it's a narrow complex tachycardia, the next important question we ask is the regularity. Is it a regular narrow complex tachycardia or is it an irregular narrow complex tachycardia? And atrial fibrillation falls into this bracket of irregular narrow complex tachycardia. Now, irregular narrow complex tachycardias, most often you find atrial fibrillation followed by multifocal atrial tachycardia and rarely you can have atrial flutter or atrial tachycardias with variable AV conduction blocks which present with irregular narrow complex tachycardias. Now, just to recap everything else, when you look at regular narrow complex tachycardias, the next important thing that you need to look for would be the P waves. Are the P waves visible? or are the P waves not visible? If the P waves are not visible, you are looking at AV and RT, AV node re-entrant tachycardia. If the P waves are visible, then you are going to be looking at the atrial rate versus the ventricular rate. So, if the atrial rate is more, then it is going to be an atrial tachycardia like atrial flutter or atrial tachycardia. If the atrial rate is not more than the ventricular rate, then you are going to look at the PR interval. If the PR interval is going to be short and if the RP interval is going to be less than 70 milliseconds, then you are looking at a AV NRT. If the PR interval is short with the RP interval that is going to be more than 70 milliseconds, it could be AV NRT, it could be AV RT or it could be atrial tachycardias. And if PR interval is long and RP interval is even longer than the PR interval, then you are looking at either an atypical AV NRT or an atrial tachycardia. So, this is essentially how you approach patients with narrow complex tachycardias and whenever you have an irregular narrow complex tachycardia, then atrial fibrillation is one of the first differentials that comes to our mind. Broad complex tachycardia, it is almost always VT versus SVT with aberrancy. Now, atrial fibrillation, just a few important facts about atrial fibrillation. Worldwide, it is the most common sustained arrhythmia in the adults particularly in the elderly population, these patients have a male predisposition. So, males have a higher risk of developing atrial fibrillation and age is a very important risk factor. So, as the age increases, the risk for atrial fibrillation increases with most patients with atrial fibrillation being aged above 60 to 65 years. So, what are the other risk factors other than increasing age? Diabetes mellitus, hypertension, coronary artery disease, heart failure, structural heart diseases like valvular heart diseases, chronic kidney disease, obstructive sleep apnea, all these form important risk factors for developing atrial fibrillation. These patients commonly present with symptoms of palpitation followed by dyspnea and fatigue. Remember that patients who present with a silent atrial fibrillation, so patients who are asymptomatic at the time of presentation, often they tend to have poor prognosis. So, symptomatic AF has better prognosis than asymptomatic AF. What are the consequences of atrial fibrillation? What can atrial fibrillation lead to? So, one of the most common complications is in the form of systemic embolism, particularly in the form of stroke. In addition, the atrial fibrillation could result in a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy resulting in heart failure. It could also contribute to depression, cognitive decline, could add to hospitalization and death. What are the precipitating factors for atrial fibrillation? Now, these are the risk factors for atrial fibrillation. So, all these factors 
இன்க்ரீஸ் த டெண்டன்சி ஃபார் அப்னார்மல் எலக்ட்ரிக்கல் ஆக்டிவேஷன் டு டெவலப் இன் த ஏட்ரியா இது இந்த ஃபார்ம் ஆஃப் என்ஹான்ஸ்ட் ஆட்டோமேட்டிசிட்டி ஆர் மல்டிபிள் ஃபங்க்ஷனல் ரீஎன்ட்ரி சர்க்கியூட்ஸ் Now, what are the precipitating factors? Precipitating factors for atrial fibrillation include hypothyroidism, acute alcohol intoxication, myocardial infarction, pericarditis, pulmonary embolism and post-cardiac surgery. Now, this is very important because often when a pre- patient presents with a new onset atrial fibrillation, when they have these distinct precipitants if we just address the precipitating factors these patients improve automatically so it is very important to look for underlying precipitating factors so most patients with a new onset atrial fibrillation require to be evaluated with a thyroid function test require a thorough history going into history of alcohol consumption we need to look for the presence of pulmonary embolism pericarditis or an acute coronary syndrome and we need to ask for history of any decent cardiac surgery so what is the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation having understood the risk factors that contribute to atrial fibrillation and the precipitants which could push the patient to atrial fibrillation how does this get driven how does this get generated and how is this maintained so all these risk factors so all the risk factors that we just discussed be it structural heart disease be it diabetes hypertension increasing age all these in some form result in atrial alterations now these atrial alterations could include stretch induced fibrosis hypocontractility inflammation vascular remodeling fatty infiltration ischemia and calcium channel instability now all these atrial alterations are going to result in ectopy and conduction disturbances so this is going to result in enhanced automaticity which is going to contribute to this ectopy now that is going to be responsible for generating and in maintaining the atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation in turn is going to contribute to hypercoagulability so not only the lack of effective quad coordinated contraction which is going to promote stasis so not only that contributes to hypercoagulability in addition in when there is hypocontractility there is going to be a reduced endothelial stress and that is going to translate into increased plasminogen activator uh, inhibitor and that is going to result in inflammation which is going to result in endothelial shedding and that is going to result in exposure of the tissue factor which is going to activate the coagulation cascade which is in turn going to contribute to hypercoagulability so two important factors in atrial fibrillation which is going to result in hypercoagulability so one is stasis and the other is the inflammation and increase in the plasminogen activator inhibitor which is going to cause endothelial shedding and exposure of the tissue factor resulting in activation of the coagulation cascade so all this is going to further drive the co- hypercoagulability so overall the rapid enhanced automaticity that is going to generate or drive the atrial fibrillation which is in turn going to be maintained by multiple small functional reentry circuits